I'm going to provide you this morning an overview of the South American heart people. This is an adult male up here on the screen, and the way we identified them because the male has the bristles sitting on the top of the rostrum or his snout, and the females lack those bristles. So a little bit about the genus Rhynchophorus, the South American palm eagle is Rhynchophorus palmarum. The genus Rhynchophorus is uh, pantropical in distribution. They seem to be specialists on palms. And there's about 10 species in the genus, more or less. Uh, you may have picked up the flyer outside, and Kadashima, John Kadashima, if he shows up, will be talking about the uh, Laguna invasion with the yellow with this one, Rhynchophorus vulnerabilis, and we successfully eradicated that. There was some taxonomic confusion about that beetle. It was originally thought to be this one, the red palm eagle, like the forest ferruginae. So we did some molecular stuff and some taxonomy work and figured out that these names are important and people have been confusing those species. So this map shows the native distribution for like forest vulnerabilis, the one that came into Laguna that we eradicated. And the magenta there is shown the native range of like the forest ferruginae, the red palm eagle. There is a native palm eagle in the southeastern United States and Florida, right before us, uh, crew and pass, which attacks palms over there. South American palm wheel that we're going to be talking about, right before us, Palmarum, is a native range from South America up through Central America and into parts of Mexico. I think humans have greatly helped to spread this insect by planting palm trees that the weevil likes to feed on in areas where palms traditionally have not grown. So those natural barriers like deserts that we now live in and the irrigated and planted palm trees have basically provided stepping stones through inhospitable habitat to allow the weevil to move all the way up to Southern California. There's a palm weevil species in um, South Africa, Phoenicius, there's also another one, Quadrilangulus. We work with the Clinton Foundation on this. They have started weevil farms in Africa where they're now farming the larvae for people to eat. And we think that's how, the, how this weevil came to Southern California, is that it may be deliberately introduced as a food source for ethnic folks, ethnic groups who value those larvae as a, tra as a traditional food source. And we have by living out of in Papua New Guinea. Okay, so red palm weevil has become notorious because it has spread out of its native range, as Don mentioned, through the Middle East into the Mediterranean, and it has even made it to the Canary Islands, where Canary Island date palms are native. It's under containment and eradication in the Canary Islands. I think they may have about 18 months left to go before they will declare red palm weevil eradicated from the Canary Islands. Now, Vulnerabilis, the one that's native to Indonesia in the southern part of the uh, Thai Malay Peninsula there, the only place that has ever been found outside of its native range was in Laguna Beach, a place that's obviously somewhat isolated. It has no major airports, no shipping in and out, just a couple of freeways going up and down the coast and east to west into the interior areas. So how that weevil came from Bali, we figured out using DNA fingerprint, it came from Bali, Indonesia, to Laguna Beach. It was a big mystery to us. There were no live palm reports. Those have been banned in the United States for since at least 2010 by the USDA. We think the weevil may have been deliberately introduced for a food source. Okay, so life cycle of the weevil, I'm going to illustrate that with the red palm weevil here, but the life cycle is very similar for the South American palm weevil. Males and females have these long snouts. We refer to those as a, as a rostrum or a nose. Females use that long nose to chew a hole into the palm. Sometimes, most, most commonly at the base of the palm fronds. Once that hole has been drilled with a snout, she then turns around. She has an airway tube called an ovipositor, which comes out the back end of the weevil. She puts that tube into the hole and she lays these large eggs. We don't know exactly how many of these eggs the South American palm weevil can lay, but we think it's probably in the hundreds. And it's going to vary on the time of year and the size of the female as to exactly how many eggs they can lay. But they can lay a lot of eggs. Those eggs then hatch. And Don gave you an exquisite overview of the meristematic setup in the tops of these palms and why they're so sensitive to damage by these weevil larvae. These larvae are big grubs that can grow to about that size. They are succulent and they are good eaters. So maybe we can have a palm heart and a palm weevil buffet <laughs> one day. If I cook them up and present them to you to eat, and I didn't tell you what they were, you'd tell me they tasted great, and you'd want to know where that shrimp and calamari platter come from. <laughs> so once you're getting close to pupating, and you can see this out here, 
They often move to the rachis, where they make a tunnel, put themselves into that tunnel that they've um, chewed out. They'll grab out those palm fibers and they'll start spinning them. These cocoons are very tight and they're hard to pull apart with your fingers. Once they're ready to emerge, the, the adults will use in the, the teeth or the, the mandibles on the end of that nose of theirs, will then chew a hole the, in the end of that cocoon and they come out. And I've cracked one open here, you can see the larva sitting in here, it's finished spinning, it hasn't started to pupate yet, you can see the wings developing on the pupa. And then once they're finished their uh, pupil stage, there's obviously an adult in there, they chew that hole and they emerge. And I just wanted to emphasize again, the top photo up here, the males have those bristles that sit on the top of the rostrum. So when you find one out in the field, you hold it up with the silhouette, it's very easy to sex them. Females have a smooth nose, males have the bristles growing on the top of the snout. Damage, very characteristic. Yes. So, so the adults are winged? Yes, and they can fly very well, and I'll get to that in just a second. Damage that you'll see, uh, the base of the fronds with a lot of tunneling, sometimes you'll see cocoons in there. The cocoons may actually fall down onto the ground once the weevils have emerged from them. The, uh, what do you call this stuff that hangs off the rack this one? It's referred to as vulu in Fiji. It's the margin of the leaf base. Okay, margin of the leaf base. That'll look like Swiss cheese with the weevil larvae have drilled through that. And then once all the meristematic tissue has been killed off through weevil feeding, the top of the palm tree basically has disappeared. The fronds have fallen onto the ground. This is um, a palm tree from Laguna Beach that was killed by the red, by the palm weevil from Indonesia. And you can see the healthy Canary Island palm in the background with those beautiful fronds growing straight up. You get hundreds of larvae in these trees. They turn the inside of the palm into that mash, which is rancid smelling. I think there's a lot of fermentation activity going on there. It's very warm when you touch it too. So I think the weed will actually create its own microclimate inside these palm trunks. You look at them as basically being a thermos, I think, an insulated trunk, like a big container that these weevils are basically turning into food, mush for themselves to eat. When we took down the tree in Laguna, the tunneling into the palm trunk was quite extensive, and this went down a couple of feet from the apex of the trunk, right down. That hole was big enough, you could stuff a basketball down there pretty easily if that's what you wanted to do. Obviously, removing these palms from the urban landscape, as many of you are familiar with, is an expensive and difficult project to take care of. And if they're infested with weevil larvae or adults, you have to take precautions to make sure the load is carved properly so you're not spreading adult weevils down the street as you're driving around. And then they need to be buried in a landfill appropriately so they can't pop out and start flying around. So in the Middle East, for example, we did a lot of work. The guys would just cut down the palms and leave them lying on the side of the road. You know, there'd be weevils moving out of that material if it wasn't disposed of properly. Now, in addition to the in addition to the weevil causing palm mortality, this weevil is somewhat unique in that it spreads a nematode which causes something called red ring disease for obvious reasons. <laughs> the infection, once the nematode is in there, causes that red ring to develop around the outside of the palm trunk. And the nematodes that this cause this are very small and hard to see. The weevil carries them in its body and it becomes contaminated by feeding on infected trees. So larvae that develop in an infected tree can acquire these nematodes. The nematodes don't develop in the weevil larva. They don't feed on the weevil larva. They grow up to the third stage and then when the adult weevil moves to another tree and begins feeding or it lays eggs or it defecates. The nematodes are then excreted into that new palm host. Okay, I want to make sure I've covered all this. Well, so far, we have not picked up the weevil, uh, not picked up the nematode in California. It hasn't been reported from the continental United States so far. So, some estimates from South America: 35 to 80 percent of palms may be killed in coconut or oil palm plantations because of the, the nematode infection. Within about 6 to 20 weeks, depending on the type of palm, the trees can die from being infected with the nematode, which is pretty rapid. And as the disease is developing, Don mentioned this little leaf disease symptom. Well, apparently that's also a symptom of an emerging red ring nematode infection prior to the trees succumbing to that disease. So as the new leaves are coming up, they appear to form, and that is a symptom of red ring nematode infection. 
You can come off the weevil infestation with insecticides, but from what I was reading on, you know, I do some Google research. You know, it's a pretty powerful <laughs> way of doing just about everything <laughs> It looks like it's very difficult to kill off a nematode infection once it's in the tree. If you can kill off the weevil using insecticides and the weevils have put the nematodes into the palm trunk, your tree may still die because you can't kill the nematodes that are in there. So this, one, this is probably what will make this weevil very difficult to manage in the landscape. You can kill off the weevils, but if they have infected that tree with nematodes, you may have a very difficult time saving that tree even after you've removed the weevils. Okay, so as I mentioned, it's not in the US. CPFA has dissected 111 weevils so far, and there's been no fines of nematodes. Okay. What's the picture at the top of please? This one? Yeah. That's the red red disease developing in a coconut palm. In, I think it's in South America. That I part stole of, that from that Google. Part of the tree is what? Is it's round? It's yeah, it's the trunk. It's the cross section okay. of the trunk. And a lot of this information has come from the University of Florida. They have a really good web page up on red ring nematode if you want to read about it and see some photos. So all that stuff was basically stolen using Google off their web page. Okay. Now, this palm weed was first brought to our attention by a friend of mine down in Tijuana when he called me up and said, hey, I think that palm weevil you found in Laguna Beach, I think it's here in Tijuana, you need to come down to Costco and have a look. So we met Chris Cabal, we went down to Costco and had a look together, and yes, the palm tree that had died in front of Costco, Canary Island Palm, had the classic symptoms. But when we got the weevils out of it, they were black. They didn't have a red stripe like the thing we had found in Laguna Beach, and they went orange and black. What is this? Subsequently, it was identified as the South American palm weevil. So while we were dealing with the invasion into Laguna Beach from that weevil that had come from Indonesia, there was another one sitting on the back doorstep, which was the South American palm weevil. So Cristobal called me up again, said, so you've got to come back to Tijuana and have a look. So we went back in May with Chris, Cristobal. We drove around Tijuana for a day. It was very easy. I think we found about 130 dead canaries that were in Tijuana. And it's super easy to find, they are everywhere. People's gardens, along the beach, around schools. This is a school that has five palms, one, two, three, four, and there's one around the corner. I think there were seven or eight in total because the palms had died running down the street in front of the palm, in front of the school. Don mentioned that the crazy looking leaves that you can, palm fronds that come out of the palms once they've been attacked by the weevil. You can see those leaves look like my kid has taken a pair of pruning shears in those. <laughs> Sort of done some crazy artwork on the leaves. <laughs> Weevil larvae in the cocoons that had fallen out of the palm trees were readily found. We pulled some of the stuff off and we were finding live weevils inside those palm trees. Like yes. What year was that cost with a uh, gazette that you did? That was 2010. So six years ago. Yeah. And it was slowly creeping all sorts from that time. Okay. So this is the map that we put together driving around Tijuana for a day. All the dots show the um, the palms that we found, they were all canaries. And there were dead or dying canaries right next to the date, in some instances next to date palms, which had not been attacked, or if they had been attacked, they weren't showing symptoms at that stage. Makes us think, like Don pointed out, there's probably a, a preference for this weevil that likes the canaries. It will probably move to the dactylifera or the date palms after that. Once those most preferred palms have been removed from the landscape, we're not really sure what the feeding hierarchy will be after that stage. And then the dots north of the border here are the palms that I found in San Isidro as, we, as I was walking across, you know, take the bridge into Tijuana for the day. So the question we get asked a lot is how far can these palm weevils fly? And we ran some basically <laughs> treadmill studies where we hopped the weevils up in these little flight mills and they would fly around. <laughs> and each time they go around, that's a three foot circumference. <laughs> they stay the thing going to the computer, and the computer can tell us how far they try and be for our fruit. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so you can see that they're obviously flying pretty well. These are red palm weevils in Saudi Arabia, where you've set them up in files of the university. The information comes through those cables, it goes into a decoder, and that decoder then dumps the information into an Excel spreadsheet that's up on the laptop. So, could these become an alternate tower source? They could. <laughs> <laughs> they the treatments. So the take-home message from that 
And we did it for the red striped palm weevil in Indonesia too, is that these weevils can fly tens of miles in a day. Now, whether or not they do that in nature is something we don't really know because we can't put a little GPS unit on the back of these wheels because the power supply is too heavy and they can't take off and fly. But I think what's important here is that if the wheels find themselves in a place where there's no food that's immediately available to them and they decide to leave the palm tree that they're in and say, take a shot at going right across this reserve for the palms that are growing on the hill over there, they can easily fly that distance. Mm. Okay? But if they're in an area, say, jumping from backyard to backyard, or running down the line of palm trees like Don showed you, say, at Irvine or around Coronado or Del Mar, they can easily fly that distance. That's not a problem for them at all. So I suspect that if they have the need, they can fly a long distance to find another palm tree. But that obviously puts them at risk of dying somewhere out there in the desert and not finding a palm tree. So many of them will probably die. Now the flight build study also shows that while most of them fly tens of miles in a 24-hour period, there are a few outliers that sit in an extreme range that can fly many, many tens of miles in a day. And we refer to these as hyperdispersers. And this may result in infestations developing a long way in front of the leading edge of the invasion, and then that area then backfills. So then the weevil appears to be spreading much more rapidly than we had anticipated. Another way these weevils could be spread around unintentionally, these are some palms that have been moved into Riverside and they were planted, you know, like Don showed you, in front of these uh, apartment complexes. And, and the movement of live palms and pests with weevils could move this pest, you know, into new areas very rapidly. This is how the pest got into the Middle East. Imports of coconut palms out of Southeast Asia took them into the Middle East. Egypt then exported date palms for hotel um, um, landscaping in the Caribbean, and that's how it ended up in Aruba and Curacao. So people moving palms, white palms around with weevils can really help you with this weevil, you know, obviously big distances very quickly, and you're getting a food supply in the there. Okay. Now, Tracy Ellis' team helped us fill in these yellow dots on the map, which indicates that the weevil will probably spread further north of, of San Isidro. And those have been confirmed Canary Island palms of mortality, probably from South American palm weevil. And then that line brought us to the Sweetwater Reserve, which is just over here a few miles away, and that's where the field trip will be going on. The live when pickled weevils in the back, I collected those in the reserve. I got 57 of them last night. So they're pretty easy to find if you know how to get out there and, and do this. And the Sweetwater is basically an area of reserve that has a lot of naturalized Canary Island palms. This is a Google Earth shot. You can see the palms, very easy to identify. Here's a dead one that's probably been killed by the South American palm weevil. So we've been trapping out there for four months now. I've got some new data points to put on the end of that line. The bucket trap that we use is out at the front. If you're interested in making one, you can get everything near the Home Depot. The bucket, you get a, um, you know, a hole cutter, drill some two-inch holes in there, put a burlap around the outside so the wheels can crawl up it. You hang the synergist, which is ethyl acetate and a pheromone from the lid of the bucket. The yogurt container has fermenting bait. This is important. It helps increase the attractiveness of the pheromone. Fermenting bait can be the yolk container with some dates. I put about 15 dates in there that Albert's given me with some water. And I put in some baker's yeast to get the fermentation process going. And then the weevils will be attracted to that. There's some antifreeze in the bottom of the bucket so when the weevils come in, they fall in there and, and they drown. And the bait and the pheromone and the uh, synergists, they swap those out about once a month. So it's quite a powerful tool for detecting weevils in areas where you may not be able to really identify infested palms. They will come to the pheromone. The pheromone is sold by a company in Riverside, Iscatec, it's really available. It's also sold by another company that's running out of Coast, Costa Rica, and that's Pepitica. So, we're trapping about 50 to 60 weevils a month in the Sweetwater Reserve right now. I have 10 traps out there. This is a shot of a palm tree that's near the eastern, uh, western staging area of the uh, Sweetwater Reserve. This is a Google Earth shot of that palm in January 2016. In July 2016, you can see the crowd starting to look a little funny. 
and then by August, September, October, the, the flatness has occurred, and the farm I just went drove by today still looks like this hasn't completely turned browny, but probably in December or January this year, all these fronds will be will be brown. This, this, these are the types of symptoms we want you to have a look at in the field so you get familiar with, with what you're looking at. Okay, so here we are in the Sweetwater Reserve. We have 10 pheromone traps out. We're monitoring those. Christina and I and Nicholas, we spent a weekend driving around the reserve. We have mapped 300 palm space canaries in the north, south, east, west, east direction. We want to monitor those every six months to see what the mortality rate of these palms is in relation to their proximity to the infestation here in the Sweetwater Reserve. So we have some little research projects going on right now to get an idea of how quickly this thing's going to spread out through the landscape. So putting all those maps together, this is what we're seeing in Tijuana. Starting in 2010, the levels have then moved north. We have the bigger fish infestation up here in the Sweetwater Reserve, and then we have the um, you know, 300 palm survey going on. The other thing we're trying to get permission to do, and this is <laughs> turned out to be more difficult than we had expected, we want to fly a drone every six months over the Sweetwater Reserve where we map every canary island palm and then monitor the mortality through time. So we have our drone license, we've got the insurance, $7 million insurance policy from the university to do this. Uh, San Diego County is sort of holding it up right now. So if anybody's got any influence, <laughs> we would really like to get to start flying the drone over the Sweetwater Reserve and start mapping these palms and how quickly they die. Right, a lot of this information is up on the website. It has the South American palm weevil, you know, the flying forest established in, in Southern California. Basically, all you need to type into Google is CISR in Palmaro, and it'll take you to this website. We have linked this site to Don's excellent article that he put out on the South American palm weevil, which was out there and maybe it's being taken away now because it's, it's a very good article. He did an excellent job on putting that together. What you'll also find on this website, this is what we're needing your help with, please, is that there is a survey form for you guys to fill out. If you find something in the environment that looks suspect, please come to this website and click on this link, which will take you to this site, which shows you what the adult weevil looks like, some examples of dying palm trees. And if you think this is what you have in your backyard, or you've seen it down the street, or it's at a shopping mall or something, we would then like you to click on the survey form, which looks like this. We'd like you to fill in your name, your email address, and your phone number, so if we need any follow-up, we can get hold of you guys. We would like to know the street address, the number of the, of the say, the, the, of your neighbor's house or wherever you've seen it, the county that that location is in. If you've got your phone or you've got a GPS in your car, you can give us the GPS coordinates. That would really help us too. We want to start building a map on Google Earth of these finds so we can see where the weevil is. Right now, we don't have a very good idea of how far it's spread throughout Southern California. It may only be as far north as Chula Vista, you know, this area that we're in now. We don't have any as far north as Escondido, and we don't know how far west and east it's gone from this area. So having a lot of eyes on the ground and you know, reporting these finds could really help us build a better map of where the uh, wheel is. If you've got a few comments or notes you think we need to know about, you can type those in here. And one thing we would really like you to do, if possible, is to snap a photo you know, using your cell phone and then upload it to the site so we can put that in our database as well. So that's all on the web. It'll take about five minutes to fill out, and we'd really appreciate any help you can give us with that. Okay, so I mentioned that we're going to go on a very quick field trip after this meeting if you're interested. This is uh, the instructions we'll print it off and they'll put out there. You start here at the reserve. The first stop will be at this place, which is at the Bonita Valley Community Church parking lot. And you can probably put several hundred cars in there. It's a big area. We, you can either stand in the parking lot or you can walk across Bonita Road. And at the golf course there, you'll see a palm, canary palm, which has all those crazy looking, you know, snip fronds at the top of it. That'll give you an idea of what to look for in the field if you're seeing these palm fronds that are coming out, they're all cut on crazy angles. And then from there, once we've had a look at that, we'll then come down to the eastern staging area, the Sweetwater Reserve, where we're trapping the weevils right now. It's a very easy seven minute walk along a very flat trail to get to see these dying palms in the reserve. 
and you can take photos and again familiarise yourself with, with what some of these dying and dead palm trees look like. Uh, so how many of you want to go and look at this stuff? Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, this oh, is going to be quite a job. <laughs> okay, so there's lots of parking here at the church. Have a look at this one. There is tons of parking here at the eastern staging area of the Sweetwater Reserve as well. Okay? So you'll have to drive off road to get here. Once you hit Sweetwater Road, which is coming this way, the entrance into the dirt parking lot is immediately on the left hand side. You'll have to swing around and come into that. Drive around a couple of these stanchions that have been put in the ground, but those are easy to get around. Or if, you, if you're risk averse and don't want to try and get around those, just park your car, walk past the stanchions, and then there's a trail here, you know, pretty much on the left, uh, right hand side that you can't miss. Then we can walk into the reserve, and it's about a seven minute walk to get to these palms. That's very easy walking on a flat, gravelly trail. If you've got decent shoes, you don't need hiking boots, but you know, the shoes you guys are very will be just fine. And we will have some vehicles to help us transport it. Yep, that's right. So we've rounded up some minivan, um, passenger vans, which we can pack people into as well if you don't want to drive your own cars. Okay. okay, so this is a palm tree from Hotel 6 in San Cedro. If you've got any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Please take a chance to look at the material outside if you haven't seen it. And please put your name on the sign-up sheet so we can get reimbursed for all the meals that we are. Please do it. Dr. Hong, uh, yeah. I know we have some growers uh, representing uh, northern Mexico here. Yeah. Are there any arborists that work in Tijuana? I mean, would you receive data in your Absolutely. Yeah, so like some of the clients and papers. So if you guys have uh, the contacts in Mexico, you repeat the question. Yeah. yeah. So Albert's question was. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I know we have some growers representing northern Mexico, but uh, I'm not sure if we have uh, if we have arborists working in Tijuana. Right. They could also feed into the database. Yes. Because I think a successful campaign is probably going to include Tijuana. Right. So this will be a binational effort. Absolutely. So what Albert was asking was, if people have contacts in Tijuana with the landscaping industry in that, yes, we would really like those guys to fill out the form too, so we can add even more data points to that Tijuana survey so we can see how you know, dense that infestation is in the Tijuana. So that's a great point. Thank you. Yes? Uh, Treatment-wise, is there anything preventative you're recommending or curative in early stages? Right. So there's a uh, representative the University of California on this side. I can make no recommendations on what types of pesticides to use. What I can tell you what we did at Laguna Beach that seemed to work was that we did a couple of things. We applied systemic insecticides to the soil, something like the clover, I think was one. And then for the trunk, I think we used something called dinotectorane, which moved pretty quickly as well. So the idea was to have a systemic, a quick one going up the trunk which would take care of the infestation in the crown. And then the middle clover, which seems to move more slowly, followed up behind that. And then in, in palms where we were pretty confident we could see external sort of activity, we then sprayed that with a contact insecticide, a pipe of pyrethral. Those are just things we did. They're not recommendations. We have no data at all to suggest that they actually work, but the weevil seem to disappear after that happened. <laughs> and Mark, you did that at the uh, parking lot, so to uh, treatment recommendations was one of the things. Okay, yeah. <laughs> with regard to the nematodes, are there any concern with handling them? Right, so the nematodes, in terms of human health risks, the yeah, best of my knowledge, they pose no risks to humans or animals, pets. I think they're pretty much a specialist on palms, and they probably can't feed on you, infect you, or cause any sort of disease in humans. Yes? So, um, you know, you talked about the uh, internal trunk area where you kind of get a fermenting yeah. uh, condition. Do you ever get small flies that you can observe associated with that? Have you noticed that? There's a lot of small flies that are in that yeah. environment. Right. So the question is, once the weevils get in, they start doing a lot of damage to the palm, it starts fermenting and it's stinking. Do you get a lot of other insects like small flies coming into that basic soup that's developing inside the top part of a palm tree? I haven't seen that. I 
That could be because we just haven't cut down enough of these palms and dissected them with a chainsaw, and I probably didn't pay attention either. I was looking for weevil larvae. <coughs> but it may be difficult for other insects to get in there if the openings to the outside world aren't big enough, or they're too convoluted for them to easily get down into it. But it's something that probably could happen in the advanced stages of infection, but I'm not, I'm not entirely sure whether or not it happens or how common it is. Is that a good diagnostic Probably not, no. Yeah. Yes. When I put uh, traps in SAPW, I noticed that the actual specimens have like little insects on top yeah, of them. Right. Yeah, they do. Right. Yes. Right. So the question is, in the traps, and you can see some examples of the pickle weevils out there, you'll see lots of little mites attached to the bodies of these weevils. And the question is, what's up with those mites? Work on the red palm weevil in the Mediterranean. Those weevils, and we've seen this in Saudi Arabia too, and we've seen it in the native range in Southeast Asia, these weevils will become heavily infested with mites. And the mites start aggregating on the weevil when it's in the pupil stage. So as soon as it molts to the adult, it's got a load of these mites sitting on it. The work that's been done on those mites in, the Mediterranean, in one Mediterranean area suggests that these mites are actually hitchhiking on the weevil because they want to feed on the dead and dying material inside the palm tree. These don't appear to be biological control agents of any importance. They're opportunistic mites that I think take you know, advantage of having something that can fly and then move them from palm tree to palm tree. But I'm not absolutely sure if that's the situation here in California. I don't know the identity of the mites that are on some of those weevils. But I've worked with red palm trees that suggest that these are red mites that like to feed on dead and dying palm material. 